Y'all, oh God. I just seen another story. They is lynching men in the park. What is, I'm scared to death. I've never been so scared in my oh, life. My in the bag, bag, I'm like, oh, this is like going to get really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Getting really bad because my thing is this: we should we should build, we can leave this in there. But I don't understand why nobody is like freaking out. Like the politicians are still acting like it's normal times. <laughs> like uh, it's getting terrifying. Because what are we gonna do when we start seeing people hanging from trees again? It's just go, go uh, vote in November if you don't want no uh, more tree hangings. I really think half of them like don't care because I mean I know if I was really there, I'm like oh I'm eighty. I mean, 20 years from now, I'm going to be out of my head. So does it really matter? Like, what the fuck happened? You know what I mean? And it's like, so old, they don't give a fuck what happened. I'm Clearly sorry. not. Jesus happened. Christ. Biden, it's all Biden. It's actually kids and your grandkids. Biden. No. Or it's just this world. It's going to be bad. So I decided to keep that um, initial conversation, even though it was off the cuff, like a lot of our podcast is. Um, just so that our listeners could get a sense of our staff's anxieties and frustrations during this time. And, you know, hopefully somebody will look up back on this in 20, 30, even 50 years and, you know, really see like how people are feeling and what they were thinking during this time. I think that, you know, as an executive director of an organization that does this work every day, Um, And let me preface this by saying that at the time of the recording of the podcast, it was Wednesday, June 23rd, and uh, yesterday, uh, or sorry, the 22nd, and uh, yesterday, Friday, uh, June 24th, uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court in our country, um, which is a monumental thing to happen, uh, and really... I don't even think that it had really hit us at the time of this recording, what that would mean, um, not just for the future protection of women in our country and what that means for everybody to have safe and affordable health care, um, particularly in times uh, you know, when it might not even be a woman's choice uh, to have an abortion, right? Uh, but what that would mean for the LGBTQIA plus community and also for our brothers and sisters who are a non-binary um, siblings uh, who are uh, black, people of color, uh, potentially illegal immigrants and what that could mean for the future. Um, so now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned, um, the fear, which is a very real fear is that gay marriage could be reversed. Um, before November. There's a real fear that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 could be overturned. Uh, There's even rumors that uh, Brown versus the Board of Education could be overturned and we're going to go back to segregation in our schools. So the anxiety for for the people, the organizers that are doing this work every day, and not just the anxiety, um, but also the frustration, the anger, the anguish um, of what is to happen to our country is real and sad. Um, And of course, like our staff, um, you know, grieve has been grieving, um, but also we think it's really important to recognize that the work will go on um, and it will go on to a higher degree, right? It just means that we have to step up our game now and that, you know, this uh, this is the beginning of the true fight. Uh, And not to say that in a sense of, you know, diminishing anything that our uh, ancestors and current living um, folks that have, you know, all the work that they did uh, prior to, to all this happening, right? Like Roe v. Wade, um, but also many, many other uh, laws, bills that were passed uh, to protect our rights and all the work that they did. So we thank those those people. Um, But I think it's also important to start this podcast. I wanted to start this podcast on a positive note, even though it's a really depressing time in this country and a hard time in this country. I think it's important um, for our leadership team to 
recognize that and also to put for our best foot forward. So I wanted to take a moment before we start this podcast um, to uh, read a, a poem, um, which I know that a lot of people think is corny or whatever, um, and that's fine. But this is something that you know we will share with our staff and that we will continue to think about as we fight. So uh, the poem is by Langston Hughes, who um, if you don't know about Langston Hughes, please look him up, an incredible poet, an incredible activist. Um, And the poem is called Dream Deferred. So what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it sink like rotten meat? or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? So I just wanted to start with saying that because again, I think that like we're in very trying times here and I hope that, you know, we can take these trying times and turn them to good. And that's what our goal is here at Soul Strategies. So I hope you like the latest episode and as always, Thanks for tuning in. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I am Terrell Finner, Fundraising Director here at Soul Strategies. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at rel underscore political. And today I am joined by the two fearless leaders of Soul Strategies, um, our founder and executive director, Z Cohen Sanchez, and our operations director and partner, Amani Wells on Yoha. Um, and hey, y'all, thank y'all so much for coming. Thanks for having us, man. Absolutely. So just do real brief introductions, kind of, you know, warm up the room before we jump in. Today's topic is about LG- LGBTQ plus politics. Um, and as an openly gay Black man, I'm really excited about being um, able to do this podcast with y'all. It means so much. Um, to me. So I will turn it over and let y'all do some quick intros. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, back in the Dizzy, me and Z used to do this pod together with the pod gals. <laughs> so if y'all have been listening for a while, then you remember some of our fiery and uh, captivating episodes of the past. Um, but yeah, since then, we've just been, you know, keeping this boat afloat in. Um, we are passionate about the state of this world, and we're excited to get into some of these topics, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say absolutely. Z, give us <laughs> give us the intro. Yeah. So, um, yeah, everybody knows me that uh, I was listening to this podcast before. But for those of you guys who don't, my name is Z. I'm the founder of Soul Strategies with my partner Imani. Um, and I think it's a good time to say, like, I feel like this is the beginning of season two of our podcast because. Mm. We didn't really have a, a, a timeline per se, or like when would season one be over? Like, like, yeah. season, like what would season two be? Or like, what, where are we going with this whole thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know. My gut says like we're in phase two, season two of Soul Strategies. We've been literally, through- yeah. He- Ooh, can we say hell yeah? yeah. Absolutely. We have been through so much. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to say, this is season two of Soul. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I would thank y'all for letting me be a part of this season. <laughs> oh, thank you for coming here. Please. For season yeah. forever. Part yeah. one of Soul Strategies. But we've gone through we've gone through a lot with our staff. We've expanded mm-hmm. an insane amount. We've gone from at the beginning of the podcast just two people to now we have what like 30, 30 people, mm-hmm. not with the field team, which is grown into thousands of folks doing field all over the country. So we, we're doing a lot. We're working with a lot of different candidates, a lot of more high profile candidates, um, a lot of interesting candidates. And we're going to be doing a lot more this season on introing the type of candidates that we're working with. We've also expanded into the nonprofit space and into the DEI space, um, which we'll talk about on future episodes as well. So like we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like what we're doing and also like how we can help, how we can help you. But today we're focused on LGBTQIA, 
um, issues, particularly in the last couple of days. Uh, there has been some insane shit going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a topic that I think, you know, a lot of our staff cares about because I know a lot of folks don't hear from our entire staff. We usually just have like our directors do this podcast and folks that are a little higher up. But for those of you who don't know, we're about 80, 80 plus percent LGBTQIA on our staff. Um, we're primarily people, uh, there's primarily people of color that work at Soul Strategy. So this is a topic that I think really resonates with many of our staff and many of our candidates. Very gay and very diverse, don't we? Yes. Love <laughs> um, so as everybody knows, June is Pride Month and mm-hmm. though, you know, corporations and kind of big business have confiscated pride and all June we see rainbow flags, um, merchandise stickers, we know as soon as July 1st comes, all of that is coming down and business as usual. Um, and I think that this month is really about celebrating the progress that the LGBTQ plus community has made. Um, but at the same time, especially in politics, there's a lot of concerning, worrying rhetoric and legislation being proposed and passed. Um, and so, um, we even, you know, have the privilege here at Seoul to work, have worked and are currently working with several um, candidates who fall under the LGBTQ plus umbrella. And working with them has been a really rewarding opportunity for me. And I want to, you know, share one of the thoughts of one of our candidates that we're currently working with in the fundraising department. Um, D is running yeah. for Utah's house. D Gray is running for Utah. Utah's House of Representatives and share their thoughts um, on their campaign as a queer candidate. Why is Pride Month important to me? Well, that is a very complicated question because Pride Month is important to all of us uh, as a community. It is a constant reminder that freedom is not something that we want. It's not something that's done. It is something that we fight for every single day. And unfortunately, pride has become many other things besides that. So it's hard because Pride Month is the hardest month for me as I have a lot of allies that come out of the woodwork that are not willing to do the work to actually create safety for me. And then they disappear again as soon as the month is over. So Pride Month is always complicated. But that's why I want to talk about the second question. Why is LGBTQIA plus representation important to you? Stories are what we are. We are all just stories. It is, uh, I had a boss that used to say that um, that's our superpower is our ability to tell stories. We have discovered so many creatures that have varying level of advanced intelligence, but we are the only ones that tell stories. Lots of animals communicate. We are the only ones that tell stories and then define our lives around those stories. I know that if my parents would have had the stories and the language that was lost to colonization, they would have understood me better. I would have had a healthier understanding of who I was and what my expected role in society could and should be. I was limiting myself a lot simply because I didn't have the stories. And second, other people need to read those stories. They need to see those stories. With the current situation in Utah, there's a lot of push to get stories about people like me out of the public view. But you can't stop me from running for office and you can't stop me from knocking on doors and introducing people to my lovely, lovely family that deserves to be together because we love each other immensely and we want to be a family. Which then gets to how do we make that happen? How do we create an inclusive future for our queer Americans. And that to me is kindness, um, which is actually my campaign, D Gray for Kindness. And 
Kindness is the hard work. It's not nice. It's so easy to be nice. We were taught if you can't say anything nice at all, don't say anything. But that's not accurate. If I want to be able to help you the most, I should tell you that you're about to go on stage with some spinach in your teeth. And if instead I ignored it because I wanted to be nice and I didn't have anything nice to say, well, that would be embarrassing for you. And that's what we need to start doing, helping others understand how they harm, how they are affecting the world around them, that their political beliefs are values in action. And those values have impact on people like me. And so it's okay to hold people accountable for the impact that they have on other people. And that includes voting for anti-LGBTQ parties and individuals and supporting that rhetoric. If you have friends or family that is in that space, understand that if you weren't talking to them about that, then you are telling them it's okay. If you aren't creating those boundaries of peace and freedom everywhere that you are, then you are accepting our oppression in exchange for your comfort. And I think that's what we need to stop doing. That's what we need to do to create a real inclusive future for all Americans. I'm Dee Gray. Please visit my website, dgrayforkindness.com, D-E-E-G-R-E-Y-F-O-R, kindness.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Gray 4 k Thank you. So our discussion will celebrate the history of Pride Month and, um, you know, talk about some of the attacks on the LGBTQ community uh, with the anti-LGBTQ plus laws and uh, bills and legisla legislation that has been proposed mm -hmm. and importantly speak to uh, the need for more LGBTQ plus representation in politics uh, really now more than ever. So, um, Z, if you want to start off with kicking us off by sharing a little background on the LGBTQ movement in the United States. Sure. So I think, you know, going back to, you know, the Stonewall riots, which I think like a lot of people forget, you know, was a riot and was a, a, a revolution really for the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community. Um, you know, the, the leadership that we saw during that time and, you know, a lot of people, the way that we sort of look back on the event is a lot of people see it as violence, but they see it as violence from the LGBTQIA side of things and not from the police, um, which we can talk about all day. I'm sure we'll, we'll have more podcast episodes just on police brutality in the United States. But I think that, you know, that that time really like showed us that there was a new there was a new wave. Um, and that's not to say that LGBT, the LGBTQIA community um, was, you know, not was in the closet before that, right? But I think like it made it a lot easier to come out of the closet uh, post the riots. Mm -hmm. um, it really woke people up to the issues that mattered. So, yeah, I think that, you know, the, the direction that we're headed, we, you know, in 20, I believe it was 2015, you know, we passed the Marriage Equality Act. Um, which allowed uh, the LGBTQIA community to marry somebody of the same sex. And I think now like moving forward, we're sort of in a very scary space mm -hmm. with like Roe versus Wade uh, potentially, which very likely being overturned this summer. Tomorrow. Of what happened. Yeah, of, oh, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Oh, tomorrow. <laughs> um, oof, okay. Oh, I know. <laughs> Um, you know, we're in a, we're in a kind of very dangerous space of what that means for also overturning other acts, right? Like the really? Marriage Equality Act, the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. and, and yeah. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people don't really understand, um, at least for me, how interconnected everything so, is, mm -hmm. groups, right? And so like when one group mm -hmm. gets their rights rolled back, for a lot of other people, it means like the, the you know, it clears the playing field, like it's open season, civil rights. Are they coming mm -hmm. for, you know, migrants? Are they coming for queer folks? Who's next? Right. Yeah. 
sadly it seems like right now they are coming for everybody um with full force and just like you said as soon as they started pushing the roe v wade um overturning in the supreme court we literally could foresee it coming everything else especially gay rights uh minority rights all of that was going to be under attack next and it's really sad to see all the progress that we did make on these issues like for us we're like in our early 30s late 20s so we grew up in a world where we were getting to see all of these really big positive legislative changes happen um, in our lifetime like when we were 18 or when I was 18 we had the first black president then we had the gay um, rights um, bill passed where people can get married and then we were seeing people more uh slowly start to become more um accepting of trans women and men and it was just like such a beautiful time it, people were more sex positive like it was just so much stuff that we were seeing moving forward in uh in a positive direction and then to see since 2016 everything start to at first slowly go backwards and now with the velocity of a freight train everything is going back to 1950 it's really scary to watch and it makes me really nervous for the safety of these communities um especially the gay community because we know just how nasty people can be towards um that set of people, especially when they try to bring religion in it to justify um, their actions, it gets even grosser because they think it's like a morality game at that point when it's not. Right. And then, like, I mean, the, the most baffling part of it for me is like we have it inscribed in our founding, like there's a separation between church and state. Um, and it seems you can't like, tell them that, of, <laughs> like all of this like anti-LGBTQ plus legislation literally goes directly against that right. And you know, I mean, yeah, it's just really kind of it, yeah, it's just frustrating to see that like we don't actually have separation between church and state when it comes when it boils down to it. Yeah. Um, but before we move too far away from like, you know, into the current issues, I do want to take a moment to like recognize Martha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera as kind of the pioneers of the current LGBTQ plus movement mm -hmm. and pride. Because I do, these are both, you know, um, folks of color and we know historically folks of color don't get their credit. So I want to make sure I give their flowers. Um, so Martha P. Johnson uh, and Sylvia Rivera were kind of the leaders were not kind of were the leaders of what we know to be the pride mo movement and should absolutely get the credit for um, what we see today as the current you know month of June pride celebration. I want to make sure I just mention them briefly for yeah. for folks uh, just so we historically on top of our stuff uh, and you know, we want to support our black trans women especially um, and yeah I just think that after all that LGBTQ plus people have fought for over the years is still so much um, hatred and anti-LGBTQ rhetoric that's going mm -hmm. on. Like Amani, we were chatting the other day and, you know, we were talking about current legislation, right? right like right now, um, you know, 50 years into the movement, we got the don't say gay bill in Florida, right? And yeah. like, <laughs> mean, and like bans on instruction or classroom discussion about LGBTQ issues and, you know, unfortunately. It just never made sense to me, sorry, why people care so damn much what other people are doing. Like, <laughs> the fact that you wrote a bill, don't say gay, to where, shh, don't speak of it. It's okay. like, are you in their bed? Right, like hiding <laughs> under their covers, watching them have sex, like it has nothing to do with you in the slightest bit. And it's funny that the party that is so uh, keep keep the government out of my life, hands off government, y'all are the ones that are trying to pass the main ones, <laughs> to right? make people's most intimate personal relationships. So Absolutely. pick a side and stay there. Like, is it hands off? you know government out of my life or are we gonna put your hands on people's bodies and sexualities and skin colors and everything else like you gotta pick a side absolutely i'm right there with you um and like I, I mean you know i mentioned you know 18 states currently have currently ban transgender students um from participating in sports right that aren't consistent with their gender identity and i 
you know, we're both from Texas. Amani, mm-hmm. you oh, God, like, unfortunately. Sports is like the cornerstone of social activity. And it is. Not worry about what happens when we box, you know, chill. And then I'm like, these are kids. Like, what happened to... They're making a non-issue out of it. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, there's a trans girl on the basketball team. Who the hell cares? <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> but it's all a tool. It's a tool to distract people from the real issue. Having a trans woman or man on the team that they identify with affects literally nothing, not one thing. Because then, what are we saying? That it's what is going to make you compete better, or or what? Like, what is it that you're scared of by having them on the team? Step the cookies up. If they're a better athlete than you, then they're a better athlete than you. It is what it is. Like we can't we can't boil it down to just them being trans maybe you just suck at basketball gina maybe you're just bad at it okay <laughs> maybe you should stop playing right yeah, no maybe. i mean the list is exhaustive and like we were talking even even this past weekend several anti-gay bills were passed in the state of texas alone mm-hmm. right? yeah they're bringing back conversion therapy which is scary that that is deeply concerning we know that that i mean look i tell people like i would you know i'm the youngest brother of three um, if there was a conversion therapy in place, it would not work on me. It does not work. Like, people are who are like, I am from Texas, born and raised, mm-hmm. you know, youngest brother. Uh, it, it doesn't work like that. It I doesn't. Would. And guess what? The gay also isn't contagious, y'all. It's oh, my God. I, 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 the, the cat's out of the bag. Both of my cousins, who I grew up with as sisters, are <laughs> lesbians, okay? Hardcore butch lesbians, okay? And guess what? I'm still a straight. So that just shows you like Absolutely. it's not a choice. It's not contagious. It won't get in your food. Like it's okay. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, like if we're going to actually change legislation um, and do it effectively, is gonna be that we just need more people running for office and more people that actually care about running for office, which yes. is um not as common these days <laughs> it's just not as common um so we're looking I mean we're really looking for people that we can good people that are community organizers that we can actually help get elected to office because we have a really great track record of doing that unfortunately um you know it's not uh, always with the right people um, because we think that they're community organizers and then later down the line we figure out that they actually don't really care about fighting any of these issues Um, i.e a lot of not just centrist dems um but you know a lot of other folks as well so absolutely i mean we i mean we've worked with several candidates and it is it is a thing right um i think that when people run for office they don't expect like they don't understand how much work goes into it right and like which is a crazy statement to say (laughs) right no really I think that (laughs) willing people just don't understand how hard they're gonna have to come in and show up like and do the work necessary to get elected especially as a newcomer like you first of all if you coming in and you a queer candidate Mm -hmm. the color a woman or any combination of those you know three different identities, you have that working against you. You have to be like ready to work. Like you have, yeah. unfortunately the world we live in now doesn't favor being, you know, outside of the mainstream, right? And so mm-hmm. you gotta come in with those community connections and you gotta be willing and ready to work. Yeah. Um, I do know that I, the fundraising team currently works with and has a pleasure of working with two um, candidates that fall under the LGBTQ plus umbrella. Um, David Roth, who is the Democratic nominee to the U.S. Senate in Iowa. Uh, Iowa. <laughs> Let's start over. <laughs> David Roth, who is the Democratic nominee uh, for the U.S. Senate in Idaho. And Dee Gray, who is running for Utah House of Representatives. Um, for me, really being able to work with as I mentioned earlier, as an openly gay Black man, to be able to work with um, and support the fundraising efforts of of two LGBTQ plus candidates 
is um, such a privilege and I'm thankful to you both for the opportunity to, do, to be able to do that work. Um, and I did ask you know, them their thoughts, you know, letting them know our podcast. And so I do want to share David Roth's um, feedback from our conversation. Every politician governs from their own experience. The beauty of our representative democracy is that all of those experiences come together and we're able to govern in the best interest of all. However, when you exclude groups for any reason, you exclude those experiences and policies and laws will not necessarily reflect the interests of the excluded group. That's good, that's good. I literally, when I was scrolling down the TL today, this quote rings very true because I saw um, there is a current representative in Florida who is holding up the money for the state to uh, keep providing free lunches to the kids because in that bill it says that you're not allowed to discriminate against gay kids like you gotta you gotta pay for the gay kids food too and he doesn't want to uh <laughs> I don't know who to hear this but gay people does have the right to eat yeah, he doesn't <laughs> want the gay kids to be able to eat so he is not yeah, they say he has like a few hours left to um to approve that bill and get that money going into the public schools. But it's on the chopping block because he does not like that it explicitly says he can't discriminate against gay kids. So that's what, ha what happens when you don't have elected officials in office who care about everybody in their community and not just the people who align with them politically or at the same quote morals quotes that they have um, because you govern all people. Everybody in your district is your constituent not just the straight ones, not just the Christians, not just the white ones, but everybody. Um, so that was a really powerful quote because this is what happens when that don't happen in yeah. the real world. Absolutely. But the uh, on the other hand, like we do need, I mean, it sucks that we are in a space, right, where we, um, and I think representation is amazing, but at the same time, we need straight politicians, right? Mm -hmm. White straight yeah. politicians. <laughs> to fight for the rights of LGBTQ plus people. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is, is that queer folks are just highly underrepresented in politics. And, and until, you know, there are more allies and people that are, are excited about, right, encouraged about um, promoting equity for everybody, we're gonna be in an awkward space, right? Um, yeah. There was a, a article from The Hill that came out recently and reported that only 1,000 elected officials nationwide identify as openly LGBTQ. So this is on state, federal, and local level. Yeah, out of millions of people. Yeah. Roughly 0.2% of people in elected position. Mm -hmm. um, and in my view, like <laughs> equality requires a seat at the table at all Absolutely. levels. Um, and like it's just really important to have more LGBTQ plus representation in politics if we mm -hmm. want to be shifts away from these harmful policies and kind of yeah. getting back to the 2015 um, progress moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, equality kind of era. So yeah. it all boils down to just believing in equal rights for all human beings. I mean, that's really what it is. There's a lot of people who act like the gays are asking to have superpowers and they want to be able to teleport while the rest of us will still have to drive. They just want to be treated with respect. And we just, just, we just want to have just like the same life. Like same life that the straight to they agenda <laughs> is literally <laughs> us just having basic rights and protections like every other American citizen. That's all it That's is. It's so <laughs> funny when you hear people talk about it. We don't need the, the gays want to be better than us. Well, one, they just like, are. Fortunately, like, they are better than you. But we just want to go to the grocery store without being harassed. That's all. Like, <laughs> like nothing, nothing crazy. Wrong. They want the school lunch too. Nothing, nothing kooky. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. Um, and so I know I, I, you know, kind of in closing, I do want to, again, throw my hat off to, to both of y'all because it has been um, a gift and a blessing to be able to work at Soul Strategies because I have been, like, been able to see firsthand, like, the way that we prioritize diversity and inclusion, um, equality, uh treating others with like just this the same valuing people uh and valuing what they have to contribute no matter what their identity is and i think that that speaks to the organization that y'all both have worked hard to build um, Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, 
but you shouldn't have to. I mean, this should just be <laughs> common practice. Like people should come to work and feel no, included. No. One of the things we did while we were on hiatus was that we unionized, which is a process that we're going to be talking about on this podcast as well, about like what that process is like, both on the management side and on the staff side. I think it's really important for like more organizations, more companies, uh, particularly in the political space to talk about unionization and what that means and how it's been a benefit, not just to our staff, but also to the candidates that we've gotten to work with, how it's been a benefit to our overall processes and like being able to look from like a third perspective on the things that we are doing, like checking ourselves, like are we being inclusive and diverse? Are we providing good wages compared to other companies? Um, All of that. So if folks are interested in that, please let us know because we will talk more about that. But yes, we, we did unionize in March. We did. Absolutely. Um, and it was, yeah, it was uh, for me just an, uh, an amazing process to witness. So thank you. Snaps, snaps, and claps, claps to y'all. Um, <laughs> so listen, for the Soul Team, our passion here is uplifting candidates of all backgrounds. And if you are someone who is LGBTQ plus or falls under that umbrella, uh, is interested in running for office, has had a thought of leading through government um, or any combination of that, uh, something you feel passionate about, Soul Strategies is here to help. Uh, And we got your back. We would love to answer any questions you might have and even help kickstart your campaign. It's what we do. So I encourage you to visit us at soulstrategies.com. And if you are looking for a sign to run for office, this is it. And we've got you covered. <laughs> yeah. And actually, what's your two? Uh, Cheryl, can you tell us about the webinar coming up? Yeah. Yeah. So we are having a webinar on July 5th. Um, the fundraising team has had the pleasure to uh, do another webinar with you, with everyone. It is free of charge. All you got to do is sign up on our website. Um, and the webinar is geared to helping uh, first time candidates. Uh, old and new candidates, uh, returning candidates, incumbents, anybody who is interested in developing a better message uh, for their voters and potential donors in their district. Um, In my time here, uh, the biggest thing that has kind of been a a recurring thing for me um, as far as candidate development has been that people don't know how to explain their story and the reason why they're running for office. And that is what does not um, let me back up. Sorry, <laughs> I have to cut this. All right, so, <laughs> um, so we're having a webinar. Um, and so what I've noticed in my time here and the work that I've done is that candidates have a hard time uh, letting people know, and by people, I mean voters and donors in their district, who they are, why they're running, and how their lived experience connects to that and being able to tell that in the short amount of time that they have. Um, So we're having a free webinar. I'm gonna talk about building your story, uh, building your why, letting people know what your story is, being able to connect your why with the, why you're running with your story. um, And, you know, really just kind of digging into what it takes to make a successful pitch to voters and potential donors to get them to donate to your campaign, but also to get them to vote for you on election day. Um, And so please do attend the webinar again, completely free. We're really gonna dive into kind of the essential uh, parts of of building a pitch to folks. And it's something that candidates, especially the first time candidates do find extremely useful and um, why not come as free of charge? (laughs) (laughs) Awesome, thanks Terrell. Thank you. Thanks, Terrell. I'm going to call you T. Can I call you T? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, T. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we'll see you all next time. All right. Catch us on the next, Thanks, for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.